All right, let's start. Thank you for the interaction. Yeah, my name is Peter, like you said, and I'm from the AOX team. Two sessions earlier, there was this GeoTipJS, so I don't need to uh, introduce the company. And well, basically, I will be introducing how the idea of uh, data processing can be pushed to like another level to create larger data sets faster and more efficient than before. Uh, we are like. Uh, some of you might know, know me under S cartography, which kind of first started that I wanted to create a, a big satellite image of every city in the world. I kind of, it's not, it's not yet finished, but with the AOX team, I kind of make a move a step forward. And last year, I was a part of the team that created the Sentinel S2 maps point uh, dot EU. And that was creating a Sentinel-2 cloudless global mosaic of the whole world. So I probably got the whole city thing covered. So every capital in the world mapped, done. And uh, since I haven't seen Bucharest on any images here in the, in the conference, I've made uh, some mosaic from the last 10 days or something. This is uh, NDWI and mixed with a regular RGB image just for the impression uh, it, that it can be done, done on the fly. And uh, this takes like a couple of minutes till it's generated. So that's it. Here is the outline of, of my presentation. First, I will talk about uh, like software and processing a bit, how it's done, and uh, what what does it take to kind of create it, to create a global a map of the whole world, in like a re in a reasonable time. Then I have a couple of examples from Sentinel One, then the crop classification we are working on, and Sentinel Two Austria monthly mosaics, which means every month you get an image of. Austria, just like you know, that planet or stuff, and etc. So, map, a map is always uh, useful. So we have uh, two pro product types. One is the <coughs> one is the viewing products, which are like basically for uh, as a GIS a background layer. This is like the most selling product because most of the people don't want to do anything with data; they just have, want to see the world with their own eyes in the like best possible way. So we are offering uh, just the GIS layer, and you can like up, uh, open it in QGIS. It's just a, a bit of bit of large, but it's a whole world with 10 meter resolution, which is perfect. The, the second part is the data. We are storing, or we are generating and storing any bands of the Sentinels. We could do a, a, a Landsat extension, should be a, shouldn't be a problem. And we are, and it can be all, even like another imagery. It doesn't have to be Sentinel at all. And the data for analysis is like, uh, I will be showing the example of the crop type classification. It can be done with the mosaics or with the data read directly from AWS bucket or uh, Diasis. We are currently working on in Dias Mundi, but extensions could be made probably in a couple of months. So what does it mean for us level three data? Which mean, it means the data is reduced to some, uh, to a result which can, which is a lot less than it was before. So you get rid of the clouds, you get rid of the spec, uh, the speckle and salt and pepper stuff, and you get just the data you ordered. Which means that for us, the level three, I'm uh, there's a notion that we could try to go for the card for all from the of, from the official version of the level three or for level two data. And level three, to go to level three, but every customer in the market wants something else. So, for instance, the first example I have is for ESA. There was a specific requirement for Sentinel One processing to be done exactly how they wanted it. Then another, the last example is for um, an office in uh, Austria, and they again, then again, they had their own vision how the results should look like. And it, so it shifts from customer to customer. There is no clear definition for us there because whenever somebody comes, then we provide him with the data as is. How are we doing it? It's cluster-based processing. We, sp we spawn like a monitoring process with Rabbit and then uh, make a Docker, uh, uh, Docker cluster and assign the workers to this cluster. The rabbit monitors kind of the progress, and it uh, runs on multiple machines on the AWS or any cloud infrastructure. And we can 
any cloud infra infrastructure. Like you can see, we are utilizing, yeah, we have utilized three of those so far with the Cloud Faro. That was the 2017 campaign. That was kind of like the experience was kind of limited. So we are working on AWS and on Dias Mundi on Open Telecom Cloud. So software is uh, is based on it's. Everything's done in Python here uh, most of the time, except for the JavaScript stuff. So it's Python, and uh, the tool is uh, called MapChede, which is tile-based processing that uh, takes the, inp the input, the Sentinel-2 imagery, and does some magic, any magic you want. You can bind it. Uh, you can bind to the process. For instance, the, the Orfero toolbox would be possible. SkyKit image, SkyKit learn, or your own functions. It's based on num numpy arrays, uh, or the reading is based on numpy arrays. So you can input any kind of data you want. You can even uh, upload. You can even open parallel tiffs and shapefiles, which means if you need clipping or information from a shapefile. You, it can go along with it, and you can open it with Fiona directly in the process, and you can process shape files or vector data and the raster data parallel with your custom Python script. Gener generating NDVI would be the, probably the most easier, the easiest example. I've also managed to bind to it the uh, ESA Snap tube was fa uh, the famous one, and uh, yeah. It works, but it's not pretty. So, <laughs> and it's not fault of the of the of the tools of the Mapchetti, for instance. It's just this, that the bindings from Snap Toolbox, there's a Jiten bridge, is not working properly. And for the previews and the images, I'm using an adapted version of the GeoTiff.js library in its early version, and it reads the tile directories and renders it on the fly. Like we, like in the, like we saw in the first two session, uh, two presentations of this session. Yeah, so you can feed it anything, and you can feed it anything, and basically anything can come out depending on the definition. So let's start with the example one. This this one was f um, done for ESA. It's a Sentinel one. Uh, 14 days mosaics of 2018 for the whole year. So we have 26 mosaics. The data set is pretty, pretty large. It has nine bands, nine bands with uh, regular statistics, average, minimum, maximum, standard deviation, and a and, uh, count of the acquisitions over the area. So this is the scope of the project. The output has roughly five terabytes, or five or seven, five or six terabytes. And uh, there is a, it's the full resolution of the center one, which means resample, it's uh, roughly 10 meters. Yeah, we've calculated, uh, yeah, the, uh, the data is the gamma zero, which is uh, the backscatter, the terrain flattened backscatter, uh, dual polarized, and the values that are stored are floats, which isn't optimal, but for the render, I'm already rendering it then in the, uh, eight bit geotiff so the uh, preview is a bit faster. Here you can see the uh, GIF with the 26 weeks of, over the area. So basically, there's even in some interferences, but it works. It's a lot of data. It can be accessed for free quite easily, especially with the map chat. And uh, you can do anything you want. You can do classification based on the Sentinel-1 time series, where you have 26 measurements for the whole year, which is quite a lot for the whole country. Here is where you can access the data. It's for everyone. The, the preview works, and yeah, it m might change because it's like uh, still most under development, some things, but it probably won't. So you can just. If you if you know that uh, tile matrix or the tile structure of for for the of the um, <laughs> WMTS, then you can kind of figure out how to get to the data. It's all described in the map chat and tile matrix uh, GitHub repository. So let's move to the to the other example. Now we are working on the crop type classification based. On the data, on mosaic data, and on the on the real time series, we found the mosaic, and so we are just we are reading the, the data, making X arrays from it, interpolating in between, and get a nice data set for 
for crop, uh, crop type classification utilizing the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Yeah, the Sentinel-1 is are the mosaics like we just saw, so, and it's done for it's been done for for Austria. We are utilizing EOLearn, the SkyKit Learn, MapChat, and X-Array in infrastructure. So the result looks something like this. This is the classification validity, which means that the red fields were classified uh, wrongly. The yellow ones or the orange ones are is the training data set, so they do, don't count into it. And I haven't put the percentage in it because you probably can see that it's roughly, yeah, it's something over 90%. So you can see that for yourself. Then there is the confidence, which is also good. The confidence is says uh, how uh, how uh, how good the predicted uh, label of the crops is. So here, the prediction for the larger field or for most of the fields is excellent as well. There are a few examples that are not that great. It's mostly like mixed uh, cultures and stuff that doesn't really fit in. And now to the classification itself. The purple one is, for instance, wine, and it works kind of, it works really well. With the, uh, we have to say that with the, the data set, what helped to improve the classification significantly was adding the Sentinel-1 data set to it because we tried it just with Sentinel-2, but uh, that's just like for the correction of, uh, of the NDVI structure, but the data, the time series, it should, yeah, should, it should be included with Sentinel-1. Here is uh, how then the NDVI uh, of different crops looks like in, yeah, for, for potatoes and cereals. And that's basically what from the Sentinel-2 uh, information can be extracted. And the last example is, uh, uh, cust was a custom processing in a, a custom grid in Gauss-Kruger uh, uh, map coordinate system that's with the center over Eastern Austria. That's why the rectangle is somewhat weird. And uh, it looked at a result, again, this was a viewing product, so we mixed a couple of mosaics together so there, is no, there are no holes, and uh, yeah, there are, so that there are no holes. And we've added the near infrared channel to the data, so we have now the pretty nice, uh, quite nice mosaic of Austria for the last year with four channels and even the, met the extra information of the index, which points to the original scenes which is then stored in the header of the geotiffs, and the index then kind of just points out to the header, which, which has the ID and the timestamp of the acquisition. Yeah, so apparently it works because, yeah, there's some snow and then it's melting and the fields are changing, so everything, everybody's happy with, with it and it can be used as a nice background layer which based on Sentinel data. For extended usage, there's no problem to add more bands to it, oversample them to the 10 meters, or upsample, or just keep it at the lower resolution for the 60 and 20 meter resolution channels. Yeah. That's basically probably it. Yeah, this is the NDVI for uh, fields uh, not far from Vienna, so it changes and the, field, the nice thing about the, the selection method of the pixels is that the fields mostly remain uh, uniform, which means that they are mostly not like, there are like some fields that are, have mixed pixels, but otherwise it's kind of like, the field is like whole, which is nice. And obviously we are just going for the like subtle changes, like in the examples before. So there, with, for us, with the tools at, at hand, with the map, with the map city, it's possible to do anything with any raster or vector data set that's, that's been fe feed into the system, and it and it outputs again the the custom script you will be writing. So it's up to you what you what you will be writing in the Python script. It doesn't even have to have a like a standardized output of the map data itself. You can write. Uh, temporary files out of it or some custom files parallel to the process. So you have then for every single tile an extra information if you need it. It's 
almost limitless in that sense because the function the functions are like open. Yeah, we've already we have the Denmark uh, mosaic, the Sentinel 2 global map, the, we have Belgium coherence, the Lithuanian backscatter has has been done the yeah at the beginning of this of this week which, which is not public yet and we are hoping to extend uh, the date our data infrastructure as much as possible and let's see and what's not also a next step hopefully soon the even cloudless server 2019 mosaic the extent is unknown yet but it probably it most likely will be a global cover again but who knows <laughs> here are the links to the previews that are currently available the crop type classification there is like a, a, a small demo project that we are working on to kind of help to help to visualize it and uh, the link to the Austria mosaic to the office of in Burgenland etc the data once again it's free and open to everybody so as long as you you are using you will use it non commercially you can use it however you want if you can access it so there are the links so thank you very much for your attention this was the last talk so <laughs> Hey, so I'm not sure if you said it, but how do you select the the pixel? So the the pixel selection, uh, the most simple one is max maximum and DVI search. Then we have some others like depending on the brightness of the pixels and some statistics like you can do weighted average, etc. And then there's even one compli more complicated one which follows a, lin a linear mo model around NDVI. And for uh, Sentinel-1, I have even f a thing I've done in STEC which goes to modeling uh, of the backscatter based on the incidence angle. So it's, there are a lot of approaches how to address that. Uh, so for the cloud-free composite, uh, is there a window that you are searching, or are you using the like the whole? And uh, the other question uh, is uh, whether you are building some kind of index or data structure that allows you to to select to pick the cloud-free pixels faster, or do you just to load the data, build the mosaic, then uh, drop everything and just move on to the next uh, data? So basically, in this scenario, it's the one and the same question. We are it's pixel based, so it goes pixel per pixel, and it's implemented in Cython, so it goes extremely fast. In the yeah, it goes extremely fast for for a pixel search and statistics computing. So, and the index as it goes faster, like yeah, the Cython thing, it makes things much easier and faster, much faster. That's it. Do you use the SCL bands for uh, for uh, cloud detection, or do you have do you have your own algorithm for for detecting clouds? You mean the uh, classification? Uh, we've we've used that at some point, uh, and I've gave up on it because the classification the scene classification of level two from the ESA isn't that great because there are buildings that are clouds, uh, water bodies that are shadows, etc. So it filters actually more than it should. And with uh, the monthly composites, it's, it's you really need every bit of information. So we have a custom mask for it, which which detects clouds, shadows, etc. So if you want to do something like that, you have to play around a bit and see which values are really good for, it, for the cloud detection, etc. But we are not using this SLC cover because it's the the accuracy of of it is a bit terrible or not great <laughs> it's us it's usable for the fields because it usually uh, has a good vegetation like uh, yeah it 
the vegetation is quite good, but for the other objects, it's not that great. Like I said, buildings are quite an issue and water bodies. Otherwise, I can, oh. I can uh, show a bit like how it looks like in the, like, uh, in the preview, which is, the, which is the link you've just saw. So this is the Denmark thing. There is a coherence and backscatter with, some, with the fields even, and yeah. If I manage to select the layer, which would be nice, yeah, nice, it's working. Then it's rendered basically on the fly, and it uses uh, like all the version of the GeoTiffJS, and uh, it has nine bands, and you, originally I used f uh, floats for storing and uh, rendering, but the uh, small tiles, they had like 30 megabytes each, so it was uh, downloading uh, uh, 200 megabytes every time I sw switched the layer, which is, wasn't ideal. But that, are, that is probably the limit of the GeoTiff, uh, of the GeoTiff JS at some point, but that you just have too much uh, things downloading to the client, but that's not, that's the fault of the data, not the rendering. And you can on the fly render like an, uh, an allocation with the dense date, with the dense time series. So with the statistics, there, there is a possibility to see ships and stuff. All right. <laughs> it does mean I should, I, should, I, should, I should let you go to the gala dinner and have some food and drinks, right? Uh, yeah. Our four minutes? All right, then I can show you the ships probably. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. So this is uh, the mi minimum in the cross channel and the vertical horizontal polarization. And if you switch then to the maximum, there should be something going on. If it switches, max. Well, um, uh, that's not the cro cross channel. Now it's a cross channel and there are like small white points which are shaped there to be seen. So from the from uh, this time series, you have nine bands. Each of them has a different information of, this, of the time period, so you can filter out and use, for instance, just the average, or the minimum, or the maximum. And uh, that, that, that decides for you if you kind of like want, for instance, the objects in the river or not. All right. And if you don't know our stumaps.eu, uh, it's quite a nice uh, map, and you, there's even a WMTS endpoint for free to use it in your GIS system as a background layer, which is quite nice to have. Thank you very much. I think we can conclude it.